This is a production of Cornell University. So I'm going to start just a quick slide on what do we get from the ocean? Why do we care about the impacts? Um, and then make a couple of points uh, um, about just a little bit of uh, background, a couple of slides on, on some points about global warming, just to bring everybody onto the same page. What is global warming? What are the current states of, of global warming? Two or three slides. And then I'll go through this long list of impacts. And I've divided them out into two sort of separate categories, although there's some cross cross-disciplinary, so to speak, uh, impacts, uh, both warming and acidification, for example, are impacting corals. But I've tried to separate out impacts of warming, separate it from impacts of ocean acidification. And then um, if I ended it right there, which I could, and if I'm, you know, if I run back or I run out of time, I, I may end it that way. And we're going to end on a very low point, which is a lot of the impacts uh, don't look very good. And I, I always like to try to end a lecture on, on some sort of hopeful sign. So, one of my sort of things in the ocean class is to ask students, once they've learned all the things that are going wrong, is to, is to act on what they've learned, that this country runs on an informed citizenry. You guys have taken the time to become informed, uh, and you have a civic duty, actually, uh, um, to, to take what you've learned, uh, to speak up, to write your, your, uh, your leaders in DC, uh, talk to family members and friends, uh, and try to act on what you've learned to make a better world. And so I'll give a little bit of of uh, sort of uplifting, I hope, uh, comments about uh, driving you guys to act on, what are the, on the, some of the things that you've learned in this seminar series. Uh, what do we get from the oceans? Well, purely in terms of economics, I was surprised to see this, but uh, published in Nature. Uh, $21 trillion per year in economic value that the oceans provide to all of humanity. Uh, some of the list of some of the contributing factors, fisheries, tourism, coastal protection, uh, nutrient cycling. Um, so it's a vast sort of economic resource for humans uh, to either care for uh, and nurture, or in the case of, of humanity, to the pres at the present time, overextending ourselves and drawing on those resources greater than they can be replenished. Um, it's also uh, an integral part. The oceans are an integral part of, of planet Earth's overall life support system for us. Uh, provides half the oxygen each year produced through photosynthesis is produced in the ocean, the other half on land. The oceans have taken up 30% of all the carbon dioxide that's been emitted uh, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, so it's done us a great favor. Um, it transports great amounts of heat away from the equator up to high latitudes to, to equilibrate or to moderate the, the sort of gradients across the planet of, of temperature, um, and, and strongly impacts the patterns of climate, uh, and enhances greatly the biodiversity on, on planet Earth. A couple of background points, just to bring everybody onto the same page about uh, climate change, global warming, and acidification. Uh, we've dumped a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that's caused an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of close to 40%. An important point uh, is that this number is not a slow-moving number. This, moving, this number is moving quite fast. The concentration of CO2 is rising by two to three parts per million every year now. Uh, so in 20 years, uh, what is today 400 parts per million will be 450. Uh, when I lecture in the intro ocean class each year, I have to update this slide and update the new number from when I first started teaching, it was 375, and now it's 400. So in the span of, of seven, or eight, seven or eight years, I've had to update uh, that number considerably. Uh, global average temperatures have risen uh, by 0.85 degrees C since the Industrial Revolution, and it spiked one degree above pre-industrial last year for a short period of time because of El Nino conditions. They temporarily raise uh, global average conditions, but that rise in global average temperatures from El Nino is superimposed on what is the signal, the multi-decadal trend in global warming. That is the global warming signal. You can't take a single year of being warm or cold, or even a single decade of being warm or cold uh, we have lots of natural climate os oscillations like El Nino, Pacific decadal oscillation, North Atlantic oscillation. So there are lots of temporary cooling and warming, but that multi-decadal trend is the signal. And when you superimpose natural variability on that, um, you'll see these spikes uh, above the sort of the trend. Um, according to IPCC report, the fifth assessment report, the la last one to come out, um, the fact that the Earth has warmed appreciably since the pre-industrial 
uh, era is unambiguous, and the likelihood that humans are largely responsible for that is extremely likely, 95% certain. So it's not like we're trying to find a signal out of the noise. We are 95% certain that humans are largely responsible for the warming. And I like to say anecdotally that we are now more certain of human-caused global warming than we are that smoking causes cancer. <clears throat> um, ocean acidification. As we increase concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, we drive a down gradient diffusion of that CO2 into the ocean, and we increase the concentration of CO2 in the ocean. When you add CO2 to the ocean, uh, that CO2 reacts. It doesn't sit in the water as CO2. It reacts with water. Uh, to form carbonic acid, and it's the same thing that happens in your can of Coke. Uh, it's a carbonated soft drink. They add carbon dioxide to the, uh, to the solution to create a weak acid that gives it its acidic bite, and that's essentially what we're doing with the oceans at a global scale. So far, I mentioned before that the oceans have taken up a third of all the carbon dioxide that we've emitted since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and so we owe the ocean a big thank you for that, uh, but it's come at a cost, uh, and that cost is an increase in acidity of 26%. Um, and that has the potential to rise considerably higher by the end of the century, as you'll find out towards the end of this talk. <clears throat> okay, so on to the responses from this, this warming and this acidification. And again, I'll start with some of the warming issues and then get on to the acidification issues. Um, warming, kind of the big hallmark of global warming. Uh, coral reefs are oftentimes referred to as sentinel species or sentinel uh, communities uh, because they're very sensitive to warming. Um, and uh, coral bleaching is definitely one of the most vulnerable sort of ecosystems in the marine realm that are um, uh, being impacted by, by global warming. Uh, corals are animals. They have tentacles. They have mouths and guts. They can eat zooplankton that swims by. They can grab them and stuff them in their mouth. But they get the vast majority of their nutrition from the zooxanthellae algae that live symbiotically in their tissue. 60 to 90% of their overall nutrition comes from this, the photosynthate that the, that the algae produce uh, for this algae. So without those, those uh, symbiotic algae, these corals basically starve to death if they, if, they are, if they lose these algae for an appreciable period of time. Uh, the corals themselves, the animals, are colorless. Uh, the tissue is colorless. And all the beautiful colors you see on a coral reef are there because of the zooxanthellae algae. They're different species of zooxanthellae that impart different, uh, different colors to the, to the corals. Uh, this symbiotic relationship is very sensitive to temperature. One degree C rise um, in, global, in, the, in the temperature for more than a few weeks will lead to uh, a breakdown of that symbiotic relationship. And when the zooxanthellae leave, so does the color. And, the, um, and what's left behind are the, are the coral animals without the zooxanthellae and without the color. These, these corals can survive for a few weeks beyond this point uh, without the zooxanthellae, and if the ocean waters cool back down, uh, there's the opportunity to reestablish the symbiotic relationship in the corals to continue to live. Uh, but if it's uh, warmed above one degree for an extended period of time, uh, then the corals will die before there's that opportunity to, to regain those zooxanthellae. So coral bleaching by itself is not death, but extended coral bleaching periods do result in death of, of coral reefs. Here's the problem that the, that the uh, corals are facing. These are the blue lines, are the horizontal blue lines, are the, are the thresholds, the temperature thresholds for different uh, communities of coral reef. Uh, some are in Jamaica, one's in Phuket, uh, Thailand, the other one in Tahiti. They have different tolerances, but once we cross those tolerances, these communities of, of coral reef uh, begin to bleach. Um, and we've had this multi-decadal trend in global warming, so in the past, uh, um, when the global average temperatures were, were lower. Uh, we had natural variability uh, that occasionally, occasionally crossed that blue line and created a bleaching event. But as we warm the planet, uh, um, uh, we start to rise that average temperature up higher and higher to where natural variability about that mean trend uh, starts to more frequently cross uh, these, these uh, um, um, thresholds and we have more and more occurrence of these coral bleaching events. Um, last year, we had a big bleaching event uh, caused by El Nino, um, and by itself, it's not a big deal, but because El Nino is now superimposed, it creates a spike uh, in global average temperatures, but that spike is superimposed on that multi-decadal trend. Um, and each of those dates you see is a past major El Nino event, and you can see that, that period that short period spike in global average temperatures created by El Nino, uh, and then it subsides. Um, 
Uh, but last year, that we had a big El Nino, as big as the 81-82 uh, El Nino, in fact, but it was superimposed on a considerably warmer background, that multi cadetal trend, so it created the worst mass coral bleaching worldwide that we've ever observed. Um, and I, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Drew Harvell, was at a meeting. She gives a guest lecture in the intra-ocean class. And even before I saw this Washington Post article, she said, Bruce, I was just back from a coral reef meeting, and, and the scientists were literally crying at that meeting um, because of the mass devastation they saw around, the, around, um, around all the coral reefs around the world, essentially. So it's a big event. Um, some parts of the Great Barrier Reef um, bleached 90%, bleached the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef, closer to the equator, so warmer waters. Um, that didn't lead to 90% plus death. It, uh, I forget what the death rate was at the end of it all, but maybe around 50%. I'm kind of guessing on that one, but it wasn't the full 90%. And the parts of the, the Great Barrier Reef further uh, away from the equator, further south, were, um, were not impacted as, as strongly as the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, these are projections about when we're going to get coral bleaching every single year, uh, once we cross sort of almost permanently across that, that warming trend. So, we are at, you know, I should back up and say that, you know, we're, we're now at 0.85 degree global average warming. So we're just below that one degree. So that's why that these, uh, these uh, things with extreme events like El Nino can cross that one degree threshold. But at some point we're gonna rise up so that every summer, even though tropical uh, seasonality isn't super strong, it'll be strong enough to cross on an annual regular basis. And, Here's some, uh, uh, a range of different coral reef areas. There's the Philippines, uh, 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 Indonesia, um, um, uh, Florida Keys, um, um, what's the other one? Uh, 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 Papua New Guinea, uh, um, Fiji, and uh, Cuba, and French Polynesia. All these, if you look at the color coding here, within 15 years, the reds are gonna start to regularly bleach every single rise, every, annually, every year they're gonna, they're gonna bleach. Uh, the orange and yellows will start that annual bleaching um, in another 25 years. So these time scales, I guess the important point is these time scales are not these distant time scales of end of the century. These are time scales, and this is a really important take home message is the time scales that we're dealing with to fix this problem are not end of the century time scales. They are decadal time scales. They are, we have to start acting right now and get this thing, carbon emissions down to zero. As we all know now from the COP21 uh, um, uh, consensus statement, was we have to take the whole planet to zero carbon emissions by mid-century. And um, this is business as usual. If we don't uh, uh, pull this off, this is what's going to happen to the coral reefs around the world. <clears throat> polar ecosystems. Um, the polar, as you know, the high latitudes, the polar seas are, are warming uh, twice as fast as the rest, of, uh, the rest of the Earth, so there are strong feedbacks most especially in the Arctic where you lose albedo uh, and, and expose the uh, ocean, the Arctic Ocean, uh, and that absorbs a lot more heat than the white uh, ice that was there before. Um, IPC's fifth, fifth assessment report states that the Arctic is gonna be uh, the most rapidly changing and the most severely impacted of all the regions on Earth. Um, in 2007, the fabled Northwest Passage opened for the first time. Uh, it happened again in 2017, uh, I'm sorry, 2012, 2016, and it's probably gonna happen in 2017 because the present conditions in the winter uh, in the Arctic are as low as they've ever been measured in 35 years, or 38 years of, of, of measurements. This is an animation um, of the monthly sea ice, so it grows out in the winter, it shrinks in the summer. I wanna draw your attention to the multi-year ice. That's the real take home message from this. So these are different, uh, I might as well just walk over here and point it out. These are, this is five year or greater ice. So this is multi-year ice, it's thick, hardy ice that is difficult to break away and difficult to melt and difficult to break apart. So that's the, that's the stable ice. And the younger ice right here is the weak, thin, single year or maybe two year old ice that is easily broken apart and easily destroyed. So I'd like you to, Watch this animation. It takes a little bit longer than I wished it would for the amount of time we have today, but I think it's a, it's a good uh, visual to see. And watch the multi-year ice, especially the five-year and older ice. Over the course of this, of the 84 to 2016 time period, you'll see that multi-year ice steadily decline more and more and more uh, as we approach uh, 2016. I was really fascinated to watch this, and I debated not putting it in because 
it takes up a fair bit of time, and I know I don't have much, and I always talk way more than I should. <laughs> but, but it gives me this impression of like a living organism. It expands out in the winter, shrinks back in the summer, and, and it's an organism losing its battle. You know, Each summer, it's shrinking back to something smaller. It's trying, it struggles uh, to expand back out in the winter, but it pulls back even further. So it's shriveling and, and, and basically slowly dying. Notice that multi-year ice now uh, at the far side, the far right side has gotten a lot smaller. Uh, we're 2009. And I'll just shut up for a second. <laughs> if you can imagine, I can do that. <laughs> OK, so that's the real take home. Multi-year ice is almost completely absent now. So we're really, uh, we're really at this, this tipping point, and uh, we've been at a tipping point. We lo the tipping point of losing this ice probably happened in the late 90s, uh, where it was irreversible. Um, a lot of scientists now think that, that uh, by 2030, the Arctic will be largely ice-free in the summertime. And uh, just to sort of you know, freak you out just a little bit, I like to throw these things out to students in my intra-ocean classes that, you know, when your kids grow up, they're going to look at these globes in classrooms, and they're going to see the North Pole painted white, and they're going to ask you, you know, like, why did they paint the, the North Pole of this globe white? And you're going to have to say, well, it's because we used to have a polar ice cap there, you know, son or daughter, and now we don't have it anymore because we, you know, we came along and burned all this carbon and put it in the atmosphere. Um, when we lose ice, uh, so the reds on the left uh, are the trends of persistent, um, uh, of how persistent the ice is, and the reds mean uh, our negative value, so it's becoming less persistent in these red areas. So you're losing ice, and you're losing the persistence of having year-round ice uh, in the red areas. And the other side, uh, the graph on the other side, are the, are, is the primary production. Uh, so as you lose ice and you expose the water uh, to full sunlight, you can, you can actually stimulate the increase in primary production in the Arctic Ocean. And that could be good for some. Uh, organisms there, and it could be bad for other organisms there. Here's a few, you know, there's going to be winners and losers in this game. Uh, some of the winning uh, aspects of it is open ocean means fishing boats. As far as fishing goes here, uh, fishing boats can go out um, uh, more often because they're, they're ice-free more often. Um, there are going to be southern uh, species of fish that may be valuable uh, and desirable. They're going to move north and become available for subsistence fishermen. Uh, but the bad news is that you're going to start to move some fish populations from the south to the north, and you're going to displace northern species, potentially displacing northern species. This example given in this report were the Atlantic cod moving northward and displacing the, the, uh, the Arctic cod. Um, and then there are a lot of unknowns up here, uh, changing the spawning grounds and the feeding grounds of, of major commercially important fish populations are going to be moved around with unknown consequences. Uh, for what will happen for these, uh, for these uh, species. Uh, this is a map that sort of shows how um, the before and after, as we start to melt this ice, change the ecological uh, system, increasing primary production, warming the ocean waters, moving southern species northward. Uh, we start to redistribute. Uh, in some cases, these species expand their range. In some cases, uh, the Arctic species, in this example, shrink their, uh, their range. And things are changing at this really rapid pace, these things are, you know, this loss is accelerating. Um, and it's actually forced the US to propose a moratorium on fishing on the high seas in the Arctic because the ecosystems are changing so rapidly that we don't understand, you know, what's the proper level of fishing effort to, to be in, uh, apply in these, uh, in these areas. And so there's this, this push to try to, to slow the fishing down and, until we can get a handle on, on the ecosystem changes and make better, more intelligent, more informed management decisions for this area. So big changes in the Arctic. Antarctica, there are big changes as well. Um, and uh, they divide Antarctica. You probably have heard this in some of the news. There's West Antarctica and East Antarctica. The West Antarctica is the, in the, is the region of Antarctica that's warming the fastest. Um, and um, uh, it's also the place that's losing most of the ice uh, in terms of ice loss. And if you look, this is uh, the loss of ice. Again, this uh, 
Um, I just point out that the red over there is the, is the loss of ice millimeters per uh, millimeters, or I'm sorry, uh, height meters per year, loss of, of ice meters per year. Um, it's about half the, the rate of loss of ice from around Antarctica is about half the rate of ice loss off of Greenland. Um, and it's occurring, again, mostly West Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula, so the whole left-hand side of the, uh, um, of the continent. Um, the um, Western Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula are the area uh, that's prime for, um, for krill to grow. Krill are the base of the food web. There's phytoplankton, but one step up the major herbivore in Arctic, uh, Antarctic ecosystems are krill. They're the food source for sea lions, seals, um, um, large fish, whales, um, and so they really, really are the key, a keystone species uh, central to the survival of lots of other larger species. Um, and they've seen a, a 70 to 80 percent decline over the last 40 years. Uh, and a model that came out not too long ago predicts that, um, that uh, by the end of the century, 80 percent of these krill uh, habitat areas are going are to go away. So, so there are big changes, again, in the uh, in the Antarctic ecosystem as well. Um, this is just one slide on other. This is a worldwide phenomena. These, the, I mentioned a couple of slides ago about the loss of habitat and the movement of, of, of uh, southern populations of, of fish species up into the north uh, in the case of the Arctic. Um, it's also happening in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, uh, cod are moving out of the Gulf of Maine and moving northward. Uh, lobsters eventually are gonna be moving northward as well. So everything's being shifted. Um, and this is a paper that came out a couple years ago that looked, kind, of, kind of looked at a, a global analysis of these shifts. And uh, there are phytoplankton, there are zooplankton, there are bony fish. Uh, and the left-hand side is the displacement. Uh, and this, uh, the axis is kilometers per, kilometers per decade. Um, and um, it's just meant to give you this general idea that it's not just isolated things like the Arctic. Uh, and having some Arctic, you know, southern species moving. This is a, a worldwide phenomena happening across the planet, essentially, um, happening at the base of the food web. Time, and then the other side is the phenology, is the timing, the seasonal timing of increase and decrease. Uh, phytoplankton blooms occur earlier, zooplankton come out of diapause later or earlier. Uh, so they're changing both the timing uh, and the sort of displacement uh, of a, war, a wide range of of different taxa uh, um, in, uh, in the ocean system, from the lowest phytoplankton to the zooplankton all the way up to the, to the bony fish and large, large organisms. Okay, so then finally, uh, one last thing on the, on the global warming front, uh, this idea of deoxygenation of the global ocean. Uh, I've heard about this for probably the last five years or so. In intra-ocean class, I present a little bit of this, uh, but this paper that came out a couple of weeks ago in Nature uh, got, got taken up by all the popular media, all the big media sites, and it kind of went around. So I, I kind of jumped in and looked at the paper pretty carefully and, and tried to distill a little bit of it for you guys today. Um, so for those in the intra-ocean class, you'll recognize this figure. This is a kind of a, basically a cutout of the Atlantic Ocean. Somebody took a cruise from, from uh, Iceland all the way down to Antarctica. Uh, and so the North Pole is on the far right, and the South Pole is on the left, the equator is in the center, and then the vertical axis is depth. And essentially, the, all of the oceans, you can think of, you know, this is sort of archetypical, uh, you can think of uh, warm water float, it's a stably stratified uh, condition. We have warm, less dense water floating on top of, of a, much thicker, uh, a much thicker cold uh, layer. Uh, about, at about the 500 meter uh, depth range is the big transition between the warm water and the cold water. That's the main thermocline of the ocean, the big changeover between the cold and the warm. Um, and this is a, a cutaway showing you essentially, um, because a big term in that paper is referred to as ventilation of the main ther thermocline. So, and I don't have a, I have to do a lot of hand waving here since I don't have my pointer with this beautiful screen. Uh, but biology happens in the lighted part of the ocean, the first 100 meters or so. Uh, biology meaning photosynthesis takes up carbon dioxide to form organic matter. That phytoplankton sinks or it gets eaten and something else sinks. Uh, eventually stuff sinks, organic particulate matter sinks out of the lighted zone. Uh, and it's rapidly in this 500 meter range in the main thermocline, it's consumed and decomposed by microbes. When they decompose this organic material raining down from the lighted part of the ocean, 
um, in that main thermocline area, uh, the organisms that are decomposing that dead organic raining down are also consuming oxygen. So they draw the oxygen down lower and lower. Uh, and if there was no replenishment of oxygen over time, it would draw it down to zero. Uh, but there is replenishment. There's vertical mixing uh, that I'm showing with the arrows. And there's also a process called subduction which is to take high latitude waters and, and force them down into the interior along these outcropping isopycnals. Uh, uh, lines or layers of constant density. So water wants to move in the ocean along a surface of constant density. Uh, it doesn't want to cross very effectively. It wants to move along. And so subduction is forcing this, this water at high latitudes underneath the subtropical oceans. While this water is moving from high latitudes to subtropics, there's organic material raining down day by day, week by week, year by year, decade by decade. It takes several decades to go from one part to the other. And so for 50 years or so, for example, as it moves from high latitudes to low attitudes, the oxygen along that way is being drawn lower and lower and lower because that water is getting older and older. Uh, here's a cross section of the same North Atlantic, and it's the oxygen concentrations. And the oxygen starts relatively high at mid-latitudes. It, it sinks about 500 meters and moves towards the equator, where at the equator it's eventually out, upwelled. Uh, but as it moves towards the equator, oxygen is being drawn down lower and lower and lower. Um, and again, it would go to zero if we didn't replenish, but we do get to replenish through vertical mixing and through this process of subduction. But as we warm the very top of the ocean, we make that surface water more buoyant. It's like blowing up the beach ball. Uh, it's harder and harder to mix buoyant water vertically, and it's harder and harder to push buoyant water down into the main thermocline and push it towards the equator. So, so the subduction is slowing down because of this increased buoyancy due to the heating at the very top of the ocean, uh, and vertical mixing is slowing down. Those are the two big causes. We've slowed down the replenishment of oxygen into that interior. Um, and that has led to this result um, that we've worldwide. Uh, um, so people have modeled this, uh, and they've proposed that with global warming, uh, and we increase the strength of the stratification, essentially make the top of the ocean much warmer than, than it was before relative to the bottom. Uh, it makes it harder to mix that oxygen into the deep interior. Um, and that's going to cause microbes to get, have their way and pull oxygen down lower and lower. And, this world, and so modelers have been doing this. And the big thing about this paper was that they collected all the historical data sets uh, that have been archived over the last 40 or so years. Um, and direct measurements, they saw a 2% drop worldwide. Some places had a much higher drop than that. Um, and uh, their conclusions were one of the big drivers was the reduction in subduction uh, and the reduction in the vertical mixing, the replenishment of the oxygen uh, into these zones. And these zones, as a consequence, are expanding. Uh, um, they're moving away from the, the equator northward. Uh, it's particularly pronounced in the North Pacific. Um, and there's some uh, uh, important uh, areas in the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean as well where there's been this exaggerated enhancement of the depletion. So uh, it doesn't take much, apparently. A few percent change in the oxygen concentration can have pretty drastic impacts on the biology and, and organisms will begin to avoid these things. And, uh, and so, you know, these basically, these are equivalently, these are the dead zones of the global ocean. We've referred to dead zones before from the Mississippi River. Um, these things are effectively dead zones of low oxygen zones that are now spreading out uh, and intensifying. Um, and we're, separately, uh, as we stratify the ocean, everybody's, most people, certainly the intra ocean students, have heard of dead zones, Gulf of Mexico, where you drive excess nutrients into the coastal environment. Uh, that stimulates phytoplankton to grow. It sinks into the deep ocean. That's food for microbes to decompose. And they also suck down the, the oxygen. But every winter, typically, you can replenish that oxygen with vertical mixing. Uh, but as we warm the planet, uh, it's going to get harder and harder for that vertical mixing to replenish. So, so Bob Howarth uh, here at the university, Professor Howarth, uh, is working on this problem, uh, one of many problems this guy works on, I have to say. He's kind of an amazing person, a methane person. Uh, but he's also a nitrogen pollution person and understands that, and is actually doing research right now in Hudson River, uh, uh, looking at future, uh, future trends in global warming and how that's going to enhance the dead zones. Same amount of nutrients, same amount of everything. You're going to expand these dead zones because you're not going to get to replenish the oxygen each winter as efficiently as you otherwise would have done before the onset of this global warming. 
Uh, it's not just a Mississippi problem, by the way. It's a global problem. There are dead zones around the world, uh, and these things will be exaggerated around the world as we start to warm the planet. Okay, isn't this fun, guys? <laughs> I mean, so now you know why I want to hurry up and get to like the uplifting part at the end of fighting this stuff and, and, uh, and kind of giving ourselves a little bit of hope to try to, because this is all, a lot of these dark stories um, are kind of, you know, they're scary, but they're, they're going to get, you know, a lot of these, these sort of predictions about what's going to happen at the end of the century and stuff are business as usual predictions, and that's why we should avoid business as usual and take the planet to zero carbon by mid-century, and we'll be in a lot better shape. Uh, acidification, uh, poor corals. Uh, I once read this. I know I shouldn't do this. I have no time at home, but... It was like, this was quite a few years ago, actually, and it was like scientific, it wasn't, it was popular science or some, some kind of popular magazine, you know, and it was like, what is the worst job in science or something like that? And there was this long list, I forget all the, you know, sort of lower, you know, bad jobs, but the top bad job was coral reef ecologist. And I was like, really? Because that sounds like most people would think that'd be an awesome job, right? <laughs> you know? And, you know, and, the re and the reasoning for that was like, this is this thing that you love so much you want to you know, devote your life to it, but you watch it destroyed before your very eyes. Um, and so, and I said, Drew Harvell, you know, at the last coral meeting, people were crying, you know, grown people crying uh, as they, you know, witnessed their, their beloved coral reefs go away. Um, these are the projections. Uh, actually, Professor Harvell is a co-author on this paper, came out in Science back in in uh, 2007. I want you to point out one thing, just to give you, really to drive home the rate of change of CO2 in the atmosphere, the concentration. These guys published this in 2007, and at that point, the present CO2 in the atmosphere was 375 parts per million. So, so things change, and the predictions are, so hard corals precipitate calcium carbonate, and as you acidify the oceans, it's harder and harder to precipitate calcium carbonate. It slows down the reaction. Uh, and it shifts the, the, uh, the competition for space. So corals compete for space, they compete with other corals for space, uh, but they compete with macroalgae for space as well. And as you acidify the oceans and you slow the precipitation rate of calcium carbonate that they need, um, you slow their growth rates and you shift the growth advantage and the competitive advantage over to the macroalgae. And that's predicted to happen with acidification at 450 parts per million to 500 parts per million. And as I pointed out at the start of this lecture, we're changing CO2 concentrations by two to three parts per million every year. So in 20 years, we're gonna have 450 parts per million, and that's what we're gonna have with business as usual. So again, it's decade scale. It's not get your head out of this end of the century business and get your head into this decade business, because that's what's happening. Uh, and then again, at 500 point, another 20 years from there, uh, they'll all be gone. So. Um, and again, your kids, for the younger students in the class, um, they're going to open up these books with these beautiful coral reef pictures, and they're going to say, Mommy, Daddy, why can't we go see these? And you can say, well, we don't have those anymore uh, because we burned all this fucking carbon uh, and put it in the atmosphere. Sorry, I couldn't help him. I was trying not to do that. You know, I was like, when I was coming up here, I was like, I'm actually kind of nervous about this lecture because there's actually like grown ups in the room and I can't be my normal self of telling side stories and watching my language. But, um, but this is a big deal and it's kind of hard to hold back, right? You know, so anyway, this is a big deal, guys. You don't want to tell your kids that they're, you know, like, that's a harsh thing, man. So, uh, anyway. Um, so oyster, most people have, I think most people have heard of this, but I grew up on the West Coast, um, and I grew up in Washington State, so I know this story. I mean, I didn't know it growing up, and I, I'm kind of interested in it. Seattle Times had a really great, if you ever want to really get into this story of oyster aquaculture and its decline because of ocean acidification, go Google uh, Seattle Times ocean acidification, and you're going to get this great, it, it won a, a Pulitzer Prize for its reporting. Um, and uh, so they're already impacted. Some companies have already moved. I know one for sure moved from, uh, from Oregon to Hawaii, uh, moved their whole operation because the waters off the coast have become so acidic. Deeper waters have low oxygen. Uh, the same microbes that pulled the oxygen down respired carbon dioxide. So deep waters have high carbon dioxide. When they upwell during uh, the upwelling season, it brings uh, uh, high carbon dioxide, relatively acidic water, but it now mixes with surface ocean waters that are now more acidic than they were before. Um, and so the combination of those two together have, it was already close 
to a tipping point in the past, but, but because of our actions, it's now crossed that tipping point, and oyster uh, um, um, industries are starting to, to falter on the west coast of the U.S. Um, it's not just corals and oysters that, that use calcium carbonate as part of their lifestyle. Uh, the base of the food web, not every plankton organism uses calcium carbonate, but some important ones do. Pteropods, coccolithophorids do. Uh, pteropods are a, a primary food source for some fish species, commercially valuable fish species. Um, and so, you know, the base of the food web is also imperiled by this acidification. Um, and then these are the predictions with business as usual if we don't get our act together, and that is that uh, ocean acidity will increase by 170 percent. 26 so far, and uh, it'll be 170 by the end of the century if we don't do anything, if we keep business as usual. And again, I want to just point out that it's a decades thing. It's not an end of the century thing for most of the stuff that matters to us, like reefs. Uh, so polar seas will become corrosive to pteropods and coccolithophores by the, uh, within decades. Coral reefs will be slowed or their growth will be stopped within decades. So, um, and uh, they're going to be far-reaching. This is a big deal in oceanography to try to understand, uh, to try to understand the impacts of acidifi acidification. There really is this, <laughs> this intensity about trying to understand what's going to happen and what are, the, what are the ramifications of all this. But it's expected to be wide-ranging and severe. Okay, so how much longer can we admit? Now we're done. <laughs> we're done with the worst part. <laughs> Hopefully I can lift you guys a little, little bit up here. Um, how much longer? Uh, well, I think if you've seen, not much longer. Um, we don't have till the end of the century to get our act together. Um, we have to act now. Uh, and this is my fa one of my favorite slides, the, the kind of consensus statement uh, uh, from the COP21 meetings in Paris in 2015. Um, and um, leading up to that, that consensus statement, I had in my class talked about we have to get to zero, we have to get to zero, we have to get to zero, but, but lots of people were like, well, we have to get more efficient, we have to be more efficient. There was like a gray, a gray target, you know, and these guys came out and said, and this was essentially every single, so I love to say this, every nearly, okay, let's just say essentially nearly, for all intents and purposes, every leader of every nation on this planet signed that statement. And that statement, so it wasn't just a bunch of crazy, eco-crazy people that said this. Every leader of every nation on the planet said this. They said that, that we shouldn't cross two um, in order to stabilize human society. And you know we're at one or almost at one now, and we've got droughts and fires and, and, and floods and Katrinas and Sandy. So one is not fun, and two is not going to be very fun at all, uh, but you know, <laughs> Scientists think we could slide by maybe, you know? So this isn't like a comfortable thing. Two isn't like, ah, uh, let's do two. Two is like, shit, man, you know, okay, <laughs> let's do two because, you know, one, we doubt we can get better than that. And two, I think we can stay below completely destabilizing things. Um, I went through a slide at the start really fast because I was trying to save time. But, you know, sometimes people, you know, I feel like they're like, why is two? If two seems small. Like yesterday was two degrees colder than today. What's the big deal? And Four degrees colder uh, was the last ice age. There was a kilometer of ice on top of Ithaca, New York, and it was four degrees average, global average temperature. So four degrees colder really sucked for this planet as far as human civilization goes. Uh, so four degrees warmer is going to be about as terrible as four degrees colder. So two is like this, and four would be a catastrophe. So, so get your head around. Two is like the, one of the most important numbers for the rest of your life will be the number two, uh, two degrees C. Um, so don't cross two. And, um, and in order to not cross two, we have to take the whole planet to zero carbon by mid-century. Um, and um, uh, the UN uh, um, uh, uh, leader at the COP21 was being interviewed on NPR. And, and, the, and the, I think it was the first time that this this reporter ever heard, because I'd heard it, because I told my class years before that, that we have to go by mid-century. Um, and, and she said, uh, um, Christine Figuera said, uh, you know, we have to take the entire you know, global energy system to zero emission by mid-century. And this guy's like, <laughs> you know, do you really think that that can be done? And she goes, well, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the climate doesn't negotiate. And, uh, that was really powerful for me. You know, we can quibble and, and hand wring, and we can do all sorts of things, and we can say it doesn't exist and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. And 
nature is just going to do what nature is going to do. And so um, I'll add here too, and so 1.5 was for the sake of island nations, you know, and I just got back from Fiji in January. Uh, and these poor guys, you know, these guys had the least to contribute to the, to the problem we have today, and they're going to suffer the most, and they have the, the, you know, the least ability economically to sort of prepare for all of this stuff. So, uh, so for, you know, just out of pure moral grounds, it would be nice to keep our limit to 1.5. This, this is going to take, you know, monumental efforts. And I'll, I'll just make, I know I'm so like, how much time do I have? A few more minutes, so why not? Um, I love being up here, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, 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 yeah, because there's things I want to say, and I took them out because I was worried about time, and then I was like, so, you know, it sounds scary, right, going to zero by mid-century, but, you know, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I always like to make the analogy, because, I mean, uh, Bill McKibben has said this, right, we need a World War III mobilization equivalent. We have to go to zero. This is a big effing deal. Look at it, I did better this time. Um, and, and, you know, think about those old videos, you know, of like the start of World War II, where we went from a Great Depression to every single human on the planet was, was working, you know, building these ships and pushing them off one after the airplane, you know, and, and uh, you know, little tiny mom and pop companies like Boeing company, airplane company in the Pacific Northwest went from a little mom and pop airplane company to a mega. So, you know, careers can be made mega, you know, so convert all that energy into making wind turbines and making a, an industry that flourishes like the, the airline industry did at the end of World War II, uh, solar panels. So all of that energy can be an awesome thing with lots of jobs <laughs> and not this hardship. And I'll add one last thing, which is going to renewable energy. I mean, it's not like we should be thinking about being driven away from something great because we have this great moral obligation. What a hardship. You know, we should be running that way because what we do right now, think about it, guys, what we do, we dig stuff out of the ground and we light it on fire for our energy. You know, we're one step above logs in a cave right now. And, you know, 50 years from now, people are going to look back at this time going, what the heck were you thinking? You know, like we've got, you know, solar panels and wind and fresh, I mean, millions of people choke to death on the stuff we burn that, you know, so. We're not, we're not, we don't have to move away from something good because we have this moral obligation to do it. We should be running like hell in that direction, not pushed, you know, reluctantly in that direction. So, all right. So, uh, I know I get going here. I'm never going to stop. But uh, um, I like, this is one of my, like, kind of a really important slide, which is, I, I know it got mentioned before, Natalie mentioned, I think Peter had mentioned at some point in one of his lectures that the residence time of CO2 in the atmosphere is 10,000 years. So half gets taken up by the land and the ocean, but the stuff that remains, remains there for 10,000 years. That's essentially forever, okay guys? So from the first land 5,000 years ago with the first farming, you know, land change, you know, burning the forest for crops, and the first and the first industrial engine that popped off, I mean, uh, internal combustion engine, we've been adding uh, CO2 to the atmosphere, and there's always been a finite limit. Those yellow lines are crossing 1.5 and 2 warming have always sat there, and generation after generation have uh, inexorably drawn us to that, that, that line drawn in the sand, essentially, and of all the generations that have ever lived on this planet, we are the ones called upon to decide whether we'll cross that line or not. Um, and once we cross it, we cross it forever. Unless we come up with some amazing carbon capture method that can be deployed at these really large scales, once we cross, we cross for 10,000 years. So if we cross two and destabilize society, we destabilize society for 10,000 years. So I know it's just the weirdest thing, right? That, <laughs> that we are the ones that will decide that. And present, former President uh, Barack Obama said it a couple years ago. We're the first generation to realize these lines drawn here. And we're the last generation that has the opportunity to avoid crossing those lines. Um, so this is our calling, guys. Um, what needs to happen? First of all, it's not like we don't know what to do. It's not like we don't have solutions. It's not like smart people haven't thought through plans. The technology in place today could be deployed. We could solve this problem. Uh, people have studied this, and it could be done economically without tearing apart the global economy. Uh, and the only thing, you can hear this from all sorts of people in the climate science area, that the one thing that holds us back is political leadership. And I call it political courage. Uh, everybody's afraid to take that step. It's hard, right? It's kind of scary to go from something you're familiar with, if you're a leader, to something that is new. It takes hard work and it takes courage. Um, 
And if it's political leadership and we get to vote these guys into office, then ultimately, you know, any change on this and any solution to this problem is really on you. And if you guys want to get off your butts uh, and get, you know, the right people elected, you can do it. And if you're the millennials, you are the largest voting bloc in this country. So I know it takes more than just one country, but I just want to point this out. Millennials are the largest voting bloc, and they're the most highly educated in all of human history. So I'm putting all of my hopes on you guys, man. You better not let me down. Um, sorry, it's a heavy, it's a, I mean, I make, a, I make a, a statement quite often now that you know, says something to the effect of every so often a generation gets called upon to do something extraordinary. Uh, at the start of World War II, the folks that were 18, 19, 20, they didn't create the geopolitics that caused World War II, but they had to rise up and fix the damn problem. You guys didn't have anything, anything to do with this climate issue, but you're the generation that's going to decide whether we cross that line or not. You're the ones that have been called upon, of all the generations, uh, you are being called upon to do something extraordinary, which is to rise up and, and get this thing fixed. It's not going to happen from the top down. That's my very strong belief. Um, and two obvious examples are women right to vote and, and equal rights for African Americans. Some president of the United States didn't wake up one day and go, wow, heck, I think I'll give voting rights to women. That would be the right thing. That's socially just. <laughs> no, and somebody, some president didn't wake up one day and go, wow, it's so unfair. African Americans are mistreated. I'm going to do something. No, people took to the streets and said, it's not fair, it's not fair, make the change. And that's how it happened. And, um, John Kerry, before he left office, said as much. He said, citizens who care about limiting emissions might have to, take, uh, might have to march in the streets and push uh, uh, for more aggressive action. So I think, you know, and I'll say uh, Howard Zinn, <laughs> one of my favorites, um, when Obama first got elected, you know, he's like, well, I'm happy that Obama got elected, but I don't expect much change from this man because it's been my experience over my long life that nothing socially just has ever come, across, ever come about from the top down. It's always been from the bottom up, from people coming together and asking for this change. And I'm a strong believer that this climate action stuff isn't going to happen unless we rise up. I'll give you a local, my favorite local example. Sorry, intro ocean students. <laughs> uh, you, get it, you get it again. So Cornell is very proud of their 2035 plan to take the campus to zero emissions by 2035. Uh, but that didn't happen with a president of this university waking, just like it didn't happen for women's right to vote and equal rights, civil rights for African Americans. This whole plan that Cornell has that's so proud of, and rightly so, I'm very proud to be here at Cornell because of this, um, it did start with a president waking up. It started with students. This is a Cornell Daily Sun archive, 2001. And, uh, and these guys camped in sleeping bags in front of Day Hall. They demanded that Cornell commit to CO2 reductions consistent with the Kyoto Protocols. Uh, um, Hunter Rawlings was president at the time. Uh, and there were several days of hand wringing and well, fiduciary responsibility and what would it cost. And, and the students were like, it's morally right, it's morally right, we're not moving. And finally, uh, they relented. Uh, and, and offer to con commit Cornell to these reductions. And, la and I've been telling that to the ocean class for the last 10 years, just about. And Hunter Rawlings, now interim president Hunter Rawlings, so he was president back then, um, said as much last year, last semester. Um, you can read the quote, but during my years as uh, president the first time, so back in 2001, uh, the students of Kyoto now, now called uh, uh, Climate Justice Cornell, uh, they pushed us, pushed him, because <laughs> he was he was holed up in Day Hall with these guys camping in front of his building. Uh, they pushed him. So these students, he acknowledged in front of everybody in the world, and it got printed in the Chronicle, that these students were the ones that really started Cornell on their way. And that's how it has to happen at a global scale now. Okay, concluding remarks. I'm almost done. Four more slides. So humanity, I didn't get a chance to show you this, but humanity has grown astonishingly in power. We're now more powerful than the forces that create Ice Age. We can stop an Ice Age. Uh, James Hansen in his book pointed that out as much as storms of my grandchildren, a coming catastrophe of climate change. Um, we can pump CO2 into the, you have to get, C, you know, CO2 went up and down on its own naturally, 180 parts per million, 280 parts per million, uh, not an ice age, ice, an ice age at 180 parts per million CO2. We're at 403 right now, so we're never going to get to 180, and we're never going to have another ice age as long as there's a functioning human society to pump CO2 into the atmosphere. We are now more powerful than the forces that create ice ages. That's how powerful we've become. 
Uh, we're in a sixth mass extinction now, the rate of species loss. We're more powerful than an asteroid that hit the Earth and took out all the dinosaurs and a lot of other species in these mass extinctions. So we've grown, it's like a, it's like a, you know, a testosterone 16-year-old or whatever, you know, way stronger than their, than their head, and, uh, and we, need to, we need to catch up. Um, and that's really a race. That's the race we face right now today is to catch up, to get our wisdom to catch up with our, our power. Um, and these coming years are going to test all of us. And this is just the weirdest thing. It sounds like science fiction, but this is damn true. Um, in the full arc of all of human history, this generation is super unique. It, of all the generations that have ever existed on this planet, we're the ones that will decide the fate of humanity. 10,000 years is all the rest of humanity. We cross two, we destabilize it. We'll have human species, but it'll be a few of us. We'll live in caves or something. Uh, so. <laughs> Of all the generations, we're the ones, you know? So, you know, people say, oh, millennials think they're so special. Well, you are special. You're the one. <laughs> you're the, out of all of human history, you're more special than any other generation in all of human history because you're going to decide the fate. Um, and so you're called upon to do this unusual thing, this extraordinary thing, which is to work your ass off to take this planet to zero carbon by mid-century. That's your, <laughs> that's your thing in life these days, guys. I mean, you can work on the side, uh, but you should try to put a lot of effort in getting this to happen. If you succeed, if you succeed, this, I love this idea. You know, if you succeed, um, your generation will be celebrated for 10,000 years. People are gonna be so <laughs> grateful. You know, they're gonna build monuments like the pyramids. Uh, they're gonna write epic poems that are gonna be retold again and again and again about what you guys did. Um, so that, it's amazing. You guys are really special. Um, and I hope that you guys are able to rise up. And, and I would much rather be celebrated for 10,000 years than the opposite, which is you will be cursed for 10,000 years, you know, people will say, you saw it, you saw the line, you knew, and you didn't do it, you, god damn it, you know, so it's like the, uh, what's the Planet of the Apes, where the guy's on the beach and the Statue of Liberty is under half winter sand, and anyway, one last, this is the last slide, which is, you know, I've had lots of my days where my gut was just, you know, in my, <laughs> down here, you know, uh, the present administration in D.C., the President Trump, um, adamantly against acting quickly on climate change, and this is the wrong thing to do. Um, and, you know, it's on the matter of decades. We have to go to zero, and we have to start right now. So this delay, even of four years, scares the crap out of me. Uh, and I'll end this just by saying, you know, what Martin Luther King Jr., who fought this hard battle, um, that we must accept finite disappointment. So I was certainly disappointed. And, you know, not Democrat, Republican, and all that, but I knew what the climate issues are. I know what they are, and I know what, and I knew what, and I predicted what, and I'm certain of it now, of what the administration's intentions are on, on their inaction on, on solving the climate issue, on solving the emissions issue. Um, but I can fold up and get small, uh, uh, but losing hope means losing power, and I refuse to lose power. Um, I refuse to not, you know, not fight this fight to the bitter end. So we must not lose uh, finite hope, uh, or accept, we must accept finite hope, but we must never lose infinite hope. And that infinite hope is that we do get this thing to zero uh, and fight back. Thanks, guys. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.